all of those things. <clears throat> now, this morning's message has an interesting history. <clears throat> I was asked, as I usually am by Westminster Bible Chapel, to take part in their Advent series. And they do an Advent candle, which a lot of churches do, and it's, it's a fun thing, especially for the kids. Uh, and there are four subjects that uh, go along with the Advent candle, love, joy, peace, and hope. They come in different orders, but uh, the candle celebrates love, joy, peace, and hope. Interesting that you have there four words, each of which is used in a quite different way in contemporary culture, contemporary language, than it's used in the biblical sense. Uh, we're going to talk about love this morning because that's what was assigned and some specific verses were assigned. They weren't actually the verses that I would have chosen for a, a passage on love, but they assigned verses from John 15. And I said to Ray, I, I was finished preaching for the year, and I said, well, I've got a sermon that I'm putting together for an Advent series at Westminster, and Ray said, well, come the next week and preach that here. It turned out that the next week I had COVID, and I didn't think any of you wanted me here with COVID, so Ray and I swapped, so that's why I'm here on this last day of uh, the Christmas season, Christmas Eve. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about love. <clears throat> love in the biblical sense is quite different from love in the contemporary cultural sense, just as joy. <clears throat> Joy in, uh, in, in our culture today is largely a kind of happiness or um, just a sort of feeling of elation. Joy in a biblical sense is something much more deep than that. The same could be said of hope, certainly. Hope in the contemporary culture is a kind of wish. You know, I grew up in Boston, as most of you know, and we were hoping that the Red Sox would win. Uh, which meant that we kind of wished that the Red Sox would win the pennant, maybe the American League, and possibly the World Series. But biblical hope is quite different, and peace as well, <coughs> shalom, uh, in a biblical sense is again quite different from the way it's used in contemporary culture. In contemporary culture, if the Israelis would agree to a ceasefire, people would say, now we have peace in the Middle East. No, we don't have biblical shalom in the Middle East if, uh, if there's simply a ceasefire announced because biblical peace is much more profound than that. But this morning we're going to talk about love. And <clears throat> we've already had a strong introduction to uh, the message this morning and the things that God has brought us to think about and to celebrate and to participate in as we've joined together in our Christmas worship. So this morning, we're going to talk about love which came down, a phrase that we've already used in some of our singing. Love came down at Christmas. And I want to go back into uh, what the Bible says a bit in the Old Testament and how it uses the word love. Love is a very common word in the English Bible, <clears throat> actually in, in both Hebrew and Greek, but especially Hebrew, uh, love how the, how the English translation would uh, bring love in represents a number of different Hebrew expressions, and some of them are translated love in some English Bibles, some of them are translated mercy. There are a whole variety of translations. So if you look up in an English concordance and look, how many times does the word love occur in the Old Testament? You'll get a variation from 500 in some translations to over 1,000 in others, and the reason is because there are different Hebrew words that are rendered love. I, as somebody that has been involved in wor working on translations, I worked on the NIV and especially the New Living. A couple of, cha a couple of books in the New Living actually have my name on them. But uh, the, when we lived in Austria, the kids that came from Central and Eastern Europe, when the New Living first came out and they... They, they saw my name in Schloss Mitterzell. They said, hey, great, we're in the Bible. <coughs> we're Schloss Mitterzell in the Bible. And <coughs> then they said, and Carl's in the Bible. So that was really exciting to be in the Bible. But uh, <coughs> we're going to talk about love, and I'm going to 
I do have a, another uh, cough drop here, and I'm going to just take a moment and stick it in so that I won't be coughing. Now, on the other hand, I may have an accent because I've got a cough drop in here. But uh, anyway, love. Let's look at contemporary culture and how we use the word love. Love is essentially a feeling, a feeling of attraction, a feeling of affection. We've been watching some Hallmark movies. We were introduced them because our to them because our daughter Elizabeth is working on. Many of those Hallmark movies are made right here in Vancouver, even though they're always set somewhere else but they're actually made in Vancouver. And it's a, they're kind of classic love stories. It's boy meet girl. The boy always gets the girl, or the girl always gets the boy. And once they kiss, and they, there's a certain moment in uh, the movie where <coughs> the boy and the girl have a kiss. And at that point, the movie's almost over, and they're going to live happily ever after. But. Uh, it's all very straightforward, and you can tell when the, the boy has fallen for the girl. It's a kind of a feeling of affection. It can be toward a person, or it can be toward things. You know, I love Christmas. Ray loves his work. <laughs> Betsy loves chocolate. Uh, that's, we, use, we use the word very freely, and it doesn't mean that much. It just means um, Ray can't stand just sitting around at home, so he has to go to work, and he discovered work that he loves, so Ray loves his work. But that isn't exactly what we're talking about when we come to biblical love. We'll look at that. Well, let's look at love in the Old Testament first. I, there are over, in the NIV, there are over 700 references to love in the NIV, and a good number of them are clustered in certain books. As in the New Testament, we'll see that the word love, although it occurs all through the New Testament, as in the Old, it's clustered in certain books. And I've just pulled out three of those books, Deuteronomy, Psalms, and Hosea. Deuteronomy really focuses on love because the big, the emphasis in Deuteronomy is on God loving Israel, and instead of it being a feeling, it's a choice. God makes a covenant of love, and in that covenant of love, that agreement, a structured agreement where God chooses to love the nation of Israel, and Abraham begins with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, and it stretches out throughout the Old Testament. And Israel at that point is a microcosm of the world which God loves, God created the world and he loves the world, but when the world rejected him, he chose Israel to be a microcosm to work out his love amongst that people. And as we are reminded in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham was not chosen for Abraham's own sake. Abraham was chosen for our sake. God said, I will make you a great people, a great nation. I will give you a land. And in you and in your descendant, all nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And so when Christ came as a descendant of Abraham, he comes to bring that chosen love of God that was directed toward Abraham and his descendants. That love now explodes and expands in Christmas to all the nations, all the peoples of the earth. And then in return, Deuteronomy focuses also on our love for God. Uh, you shall love the Lord your God with heart, with soul, and strength. Jesus quotes virtually the same thing. Jesus says in the New Testament, you shall love the Lord your God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, or heart, soul, and uh, mind couple of different ways that he puts it, but he's quoting Deuteronomy, and just as God made a choice, a decision to love Israel, so we make a decision to love the Lord. It's, uh, yes, there's a feeling of, of affection and attraction that's involved in it, and the Bible, by the way, 
does use love in a romantic sense, but primarily love is not a feeling, love is a decision that we make. And we see that in, uh, the, in the Psalms, there are a hundred and some uses of the word love in the Psalms, and we're going to look at the objects of love in a couple of slides down. But in all of those uh, uses, there's fundamental to it is the idea that we actually make a decision to love. And that's based on God having made a decision to love us. The Psalms has a very rich vocabulary of love. And then the third, the third Old Testament book that I've pulled out, just because it's a book all about love, especially the first few chapters, Hosea. And it's a woman named Gomer. And Gomer uh, was a woman who was drawn toward prostitution, or at least a, a loose lifestyle. She went after other lovers. And as a, uh, as a kind of picture of God's love for Israel, God says to the prophet, Hosea, go and take a wife who has this propensity to go after other lovers, but I want you, in spite of her sin, I want you, Hosea, to choose to love Gomer. And Hosea chooses, in obedience to God, to love Gomer, and God says, this is a picture of my love for Israel, which has a propensity to go after other gods and other lovers, but I'm not going to let her go. And in Hosea chapter 2, and especially chapter 3, you have this amazing picture of God really almost imprisoning <laughs> Gomer to come back and he says, I'm going to take her into the wilderness. I'll ban all of her other lovers and I'm going to remind her in the wilderness that it was I who gave her all those good clothes. I was the one that gave her the rich food and the good wine. I was the one that poured out my love upon her. And maybe when I've taken away all these other things as God did in the exile, maybe she'll come back to me and realize that it was my love. That, uh, that was fundamental to her existence in the beginning. And so those are Old Testament lessons that, uh, that use the word, but always uh, the word love is, the fundamental meaning of love is a choice to set one's affection, to set one's attraction on the object of one's love. We don't fall into love with God, we may, we may find ourselves just drawn to Jesus for all the reasons that we understand. We've celebrated Jesus today with, with song, and thank you so much for everyone who has, as the kids were great, and thank you for uh, the special music. Uh, yes, it's, it's easy if we see how attractive Jesus is, and Ray reminded us of some of those things, thinking about the Jesus who spoke, the Jesus who looked with compassion, the Jesus who, uh, who was just one, a person that you could simply fall in love with. But the same people also had the capacity to hate him and to crucify him. Uh, but we, as those who have been drawn to Jesus, are called then to make a commitment to Jesus. Why? Because God loved us first. Uh, and we're going to look at these kinds of verses. Here in his love, John says, not that we love God, but that God loved us and gave his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So it's a choice that is made. Well, I want to look at uh, the objects of human love that we have in the Old Testament. And these are the kind of things, these are things that we today, we can make a choice to love or not to love. We can love good things. Justice, of course, is something that we can love. We can love justice. We can mer love mercy. We can love God's creation. There are all kinds of good things that we can set our affection on and love them. And of course, um, we can love bad things as well. We can love violence. The scripture speaks of men loving violence. And in John, in the, uh, uh, in the New Testament, men loved darkness because their deeds were evil. 
So we can choose to set our affection and apply our, our, our commitment, make a commitment to evil things as well as good. We can love people. There is a place for romantic love in the Old Testament. We have uh, Jacob who loved Rachel. I would argue that, by the way, Leah was the one that God chose for him. If you look at the entire story, Leah is the central wife. She's actually the one he's buried with, by the way. Rachel is the one he's drawn to, but Leah is the one that he makes a decision to follow because God had given him Leah, as well as ultimately Rachel. Um, we also love family, we love friends, and um, we are called to love the widow, the orphan, and the alien. And one of the things that I love about being here at, at uh, Ladner Gospel Assembly is that we have so many people who are like myself. Betsy and I are immigrants to Canada. Uh, I don't know how many of us totally out of this congregation are immigrants and how many were native born. By the way, my family on my mother's side goes back to 1755 in Canada. Uh, but I was born in the United States, but my family were Canadian. But for most of us who were immigrants, you're the first generation. And what, is, what do we do as a biblical community? We love the widow. We love the orphan. We love the person who comes to sojourn among us. Why? Because God loves those people. <laughs> and God sent his son. Love came down at Christmas for all of us, and especially those who are in special need of care. God looks out for them. And of course, then uh, people love God. We love God in the Old Testament. Um, then we have the objects of divine love. And I haven't time to stop on this, but I have a slide on it. But there are all kinds of, we've talked about the things that God loves in the Old Testament. One of the things that I like down toward the bottom, people who have trouble sleeping. God, it says, loves people who have trouble sleeping. And there are all kinds of other things, that other kinds of people and other situations that God loves. But I thought that was one of them because as you get older, sometimes you lie awake at night. You wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. You can't go to sleep. And you think, why is all of this happening? Well, I, in a very special way, God says, yeah, uh, when you can't sleep, remember I've made a choice to love you whether you can sleep or not, and you can think about that and pray about it. So there are all kinds of things that God loves in the Old Testament, so we can rejoice in that. Well, let's go to the New Testament. That's where we want to focus this morning. It's Christmas Eve, and we're going to focus on the love coming down. And I thought of so many hymns, there are just so many wonderful hymns about love, and uh, I, there's one that... One of my favorites, Charles Wesley, an 18th century uh, hymn writer. Uh, he, by the way, was number 18 of 18 children. So, you know, if his family decided, well, we're going to quit a little earlier. And in those days, you didn't quit a little earlier. The kids just kept coming uh, in those days. And actually, 60 years ago, when Betsy and I were married, the kids just sort of came in those days. Now they're all planned and everything's, everything's set. Uh, we just got married and had kids, but we didn't have 18. But Charles Wesley was number 18, and he wrote some of the most absolutely glorious hymns that the English language has ever known. And this one is actually, in a recent survey of English hymns, this was chosen as the favorite hymn of, uh, of people. And we lived in England for many years, so we participated in this. But Wesley's hymn, Love Divine. All love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure, unbounded love thou art. Visit us with thy salvation. Enter every trembling heart. Now, the rest of that hymn is, uh, and the British, by the way, have a different tune, which is much more majestic than the tune that we use. And uh, I love that hymn. But there are many others because the love of God has inspired perhaps the greatest outpouring of poetry 
that we've ever known in the English language. And I suspect in every other language that celebrates the love of God, uh, the hymn writers that write hymns for the, and the only two languages or three languages that I know a lot of hymns in are English and German and a lot of Spanish hymns. But I'm sure the same is true uh, whether you're in Oriental uh, countries or where, wherever you are in the world. The love of God inspires hymn writers. So love in the, in the, in the New Testament, uh, again, over 300 references to love in the New Testament. And if you look at where they're clustered, over a hundred of those, over one third of those references to love in the New Testament come in the writings of John. John's Gospel and 1 John, the three letters, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, contain, I think, about 108 or so, I've, I've got the number down here, uh, references to love. And those references are summed up in two verses that I've given you on the slide, one from the Gospel of John and one from John's epistle. The first one, for God so loved the world that he gave, and I put this in the King James Version for reasons that you'll see later on, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten or his unique or one and only son that whoso, whoever, <coughs> believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the next verse goes on and says, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have life. And then the same thought comes from John's epistle, in 1 John, herein is love, the King James says, or this is love. Not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son to become an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And these are the primary thoughts in the New, that dominate the New Testament treatment of the concept of love. And again, you can see how totally foreign this is to the way we use love today. We sort of fall into love. You never know when it's going to hit you. And this is, you know, somebody I, when I was doing a lot of counseling as a chaplain in the Navy, um, which I did more of than, uh, <laughs> more of that kind of counseling than I did as an academic at Regent College. But people would come in, they'd say, chaplain, I got a problem. I've fallen in love with somebody that isn't my wife. I say, now wait a minute, let's, let's stop and talk about this. Well, you know, I just plain fell in love. What can I do about it? Well, you can do a lot about it. You can go back to your wedding vows and you can decide first whether love is something you fall into and out of or whether love is a choice that you make as the Bible says it is and God says anything he commands us to do, he will give us the power, the ability to do. And what that means is that if we have made a vow to love our wife, we have the choice to obey that vow, to continue to that vow with the promise of God's power and strength to enable us to fulfill that vow, or we have the choice to abandon the vow and fall into or out of love. And I know people who've fallen into and out of love a hundred times. It, it's not sometimes not very lasting. But God's love is based on his choice. Ephesians 5 says, Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. John 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave himself for us. And so that's where the New Testament is dominated in the idea of love. And this is, of course, fundamental to Christmas. Again, Christmas is all about love coming down into our reality, and it comes down because God made a choice to send his Son in order that he might become our Savior and Lord. So I, I want to just now go to these verses in John 15, that uh, I was actually assigned in Westminster. 
Uh, and they're interesting verses because they're part of a long section, John 13 through 17, uh, which pictures Jesus in dialogue with his disciples. They're obviously on the way somewhere. They're on the way to the garden. And chapter 13 uh, begins it with, uh, <clears throat> with uh, a passage that talks about relationships and love. And in fact, a lot of what we're going to read in these few verses is there in John 13 as well, especially the commandment to love one another. Uh, but uh, then we come to this John 15, which is right after the vine passage. God said, I am, or Jesus said, my, I am the vine, you are the branches, my father is the vine dresser. And he has this long section in chapter, in chapter 15, verses one to eight, talking about remaining in the vine, being a branch in the vine. And then he picks up in verse nine and says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Uh, if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. Uh, I have told you these things uh, that uh, my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be complete. My commandment, uh, whoops, my commandment is this, love one another as I, as love each other um, as I have loved you. And it goes on, the next slide has the, has a few more verses, but we're going to come back to them because our time is a bit short. I'm not going to read this second slide of verses, but we're going to come back to them in the brief summary that I'm going to give you as we continue and close this message. So now I want to take these verses and talk about the love of God. And I think you'll see, uh, you'll see something that gives you a glimpse of what it means for God to love us and for us to love one another. And by the way, there are three steps in this. You'll see it all the way through. As the Father has loved me. That's the first step. As the Father has loved me. And then Jesus says, so I have loved you. And now, just as I have loved you, you are to love one another. And that's where, that's where this is all going. But let's go and look. Let's just analyze the love of God a bit. First, its source. The source of love is God. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. It's the Father's love demonstrated in the relationship between Father and Son, and then expressed in the relationship between the Son and his disciples, and then worked out in the relationships that we have in the church as we, in Jesus' name, love one another. And John, 1 John 4 twice puts it this way. It says, God is love. If we want to understand what love is, 1 John says, it doesn't say God acts in love. He does. It doesn't emphasize the fact that God, uh, God sort of looks like love. It says God is love. And Jesus made the point that if we want to understand love, we look at Jesus, and Jesus reflects the Father. And so the love of God, which is an essential characteristic or quality of God himself, which existed from eternity in the relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and which is specifically poured out in Christmas, as the love of God bodily takes form in the baby born in the manger. That love, the source of it, is God. And the only way we know about it in its perfection is through Jesus, through Christmas. Yes, the Old Testament is full of expressions of love and acts of love, but the perfect understanding of love had to wait until the baby was born in the manger and God's love came down to us. Love divine, all loves excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. 
And so the source of love, if we want to understand love, study God, relate to God, find out what God is like, and we'll find out what love is like. It's a lot better than just waiting to fall in love over a Hallmark film. Uh, okay, the second point, the context of love is relationships. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. But unlike a servant relationship where Jesus is the Lord and master and you're all my servants and you do just what I tell you, instead he says, I've swept all of that away and I've made you my friends because unlike a servant, a friend understands fully his master's business. And he says here that everything that I've learned from the Father, I have passed on to you. This is an incredible relationship. And if we go back into these chapters, I've been reading these chapters in the last month, and they've been, they're incredibly rich, John 13 through 17 or 18. But it talks about remaining in me, remain in me and my love remain in you. The vine and the branches, that uh, metaphor of us remaining. And back in chapter 13, it says that uh, my father and I will come and make our home in you. I in you and you in me. We will dwell in you <coughs> and you will dwell in us. And I used to wrestle with this when I was a kid. What does it mean for God to live in me and for me to live in God? Well, somehow, <coughs> it's such a close relationship that the actual, through the Holy Spirit, the person of God is actually taking some form and shape in me and my personality and my person so that we are actually drawn into a relationship that transcends even a husband-wife relationship or a parent-child relationship, it's the deepest relationship that we could ever imagine. God says, I and my Father are going to come and we are going to make our dwelling in you. You will live in us, we will live in you. And he says all this will happen through the Spirit. So the relationship uh, of remaining in him is fundamental to the context of love. So the reason we love God and God loves us is that he has drawn us into a relationship where he's part of us and we're part of him and we care for one another in that sense. The working principle of, of divine love is actually submission. And Jesus, several times all through these chapters, he says, now uh, remain in me, in my love, I, if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. And you know, you, you say, well, isn't this a condition on our salvation? Isn't God saying to us, it's just not some great gift at Christmas that you can celebrate, it's a bunch of rules. Because, you know, you look into the fine print, you just thought you could come to Jesus without, without having to pay anything because grace is free. And then once you're inside, you've got a bunch of rules that you have to keep up with or you're going to be out. No, no, that's not what it's about. It's about a relationship that depends on mutual submission. The analogy that the Bible uses is marriage. When we come into a marriage relationship, there are certain expectations that will make the relationship work. And if you violate those principles, the relationship won't work. And sadly, we live in a world, and many of us have experienced this, where marriage relationships simply haven't worked. We live in a broken world, and we have to accept that. And we, as the church, are part of that broken world, and so we love and care for people whose marriages have broken down, whose families have broken down. That's just the way it is, friends. And we're called to be loving one another, uh, but for it to work, there are certain expectations. And Jesus says, I've taught you a way of life. I've given you some commandments. They aren't odious. They're good commandments. 
And if you keep those commandments, you will remain in my love. Just as my father and I have a perfect relationship, but it also involves submission. And I am in submission to my father, and I remain in his love. And if you are going to remain in my love, keep my teaching, keep my commandments. And so that's the working principle of it. Next, the, um, the, experience, the expression of divine love is sacrifice or sacrificial love. Uh, the scripture that we've read says, uh, greater love has no one than this, that a person lay down his life for his friends. Now, if you go back in John 13 through 17, you'll see a number of other ways. Foot washing. Chapter 13 starts with foot washing, where Jesus uh, they're gathered around, they're, they're having a meal together, and Jesus at some point takes his coat off and he said, now, okay, come on up here, and he takes a bowl of water and he sets it out, and I've lived in the Middle East. Uh, the roads are dirty, and they all wore sandals, which meant that by the end of the day, their feet were all dirty and smelly and whatever, and Jesus says, come, you sit down here, and I'm going to wash your feet. And uh, he, he makes quite a point of washing the disciples' feet, and then he says, oh, by the way, I've given you an example. In washing your feet, I've given you an example because part of the relationship that I've come to bring you through Christmas and through my sacrifice on the cross was to bring you into the kind of relationship where you're going to serve one another, and you're going to wash one another's feet. And you know, one of the things I like about being in this community, it's anything but a perfect community. If you live here, you know that. I, they say if you find a perfect church, don't go because you'll spoil it. But, uh, <coughs> but there's a heck of a lot of foot washing that goes on in this community. And that's because Jesus designed it to be that. In coming to the, as a babe in, in the manger, and dying on the cross and sending the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, he designed a community of people that would be in submission to one another, would sacrifice one another, and ultimately would give their lives for one another. Greater love has no one than this, that a person give his life for his friends. And again, the model is Jesus. He gave his life for his friends. And so we have the opportunity to do that as well. So then finally, the goal, not finally, but almost finally, the goal of divine love is joy. I have told you these things so that my joy may remain in you and your joy may be complete. One of, one of the things that I, I have trouble with, I, in today's world, there's so many angry people and so many sad people. You know, the world is depressing. You turn on the news and it's depressing. You talk to people and it's depressing. In biblical faith, whatever troubles there are, Jesus said in the world, and it's in this passage, in the world you will have tribulation. It's in the next chapter. In the world you are going to have tribulation. The world will in fact hate you. But I have told you these things so that my joy can remain in you and that your joy may be complete. So the goal of this whole relationship is joy. And I love the fact that we have joyfully worshipped this morning. <laughs> I mean, we, we, have, we have had joy just oozing from the pores this morning as we've come to adore the babe in the manger and the Son of God who gave himself for us. So the goal is joy. And then finally the reward, well not finally, again there's one more, the reward is fruitfulness. <laughs> yeah. You did not choose me but I chose you and appointed you that you should go forth and bear fruit and it will be fruit that will last. Uh, that's what my father has called you to be fruitful. 
And the idea that we're a community of useless people performing useless acts when we come to worship, making no difference in the world, that's not it, my friends. We are called in Christ to be a fruitful community, to bear fruit, and it's fruit that will remain. Ray illustrated this morning with the call from the chap who lost his wife. That's fruit that remains. And that's what God has called us to in his love. And then, finally, the challenge of divine love is reproduction. My commandment is this, love one another. How? As I have loved you. How did I love you as the Father loved me? How did I express that love? Greater love has no one than this, that a person give up his life for his friend. Amen. Are we prepared to go out and make the kind of disciples that will see in us the kind of love that Jesus expressed by giving his life for us? Are we prepared to give our lives for the community of believers and then to go out of the community of believers and take with us the kind of love, the sacrificial love that gives our life as a church for the lost world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I want to close with just a couple of hymns. One I'll read to you. What wondrous love is this? I, this is an old hymn. Come, the first time it actually shows up is 1811. Nobody knows where it came from. But <clears throat> this hymn came to public notice a few weeks ago when Jimmy Carter's wife, Rosalind, Rosalind, was buried in a very public funeral. Now, Rosalind Carter was a very opinionated woman. She was a very strong woman, a very intelligent woman, and she had strong thoughts, and she actually had an incredible influence on her husband, on the government, and on all kinds of things. Her politics were different from mine. Uh, we didn't always agree on things like that. But she chose her own hymns for her funeral. What hymn did she choose? And the choir sang it marvelously. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul. What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. I thought whatever differences I ever had with Rosalind Carter just disappeared right down the drain at that point. <laughs> I thought this is a woman that I love in the Lord and her memory is a memory that the world will treasure. What wondrous love is this. <coughs> I want to close with some music that's going to be played for us. It is a musical rendition of John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is a two to three minute presentation. It comes from an oratorio written in the 19th century by Sir John Stainer. The oratorio is called The Crucifixion. This is one of the best known pieces of music in, English, in the English repertoire. And I want us to meditate on it as we think about Christmas, as we think about what God did for us in sending his son down into our reality in order that we might know the love of God which apart from Christ Jesus, we could never know perfectly. And in Christ Jesus, we can know absolutely perfectly. We can enter into it, we can experience it, and the good news is we can share it. Amen. We can shed that love abroad in our heart. I want us just to meditate on this music as we listen to it with the words of Jesus.
thank you that you so loved us that you sent your son as a babe in the manger, as one of us to walk the streets of Palestine, to show us the Father, ultimately to give his life for his friends. Lord, as we celebrate Christmas this year, we pray that the love of God, the love of Christ might constrain us, knowing that as we thus judge, that if one died, then we're all dead, and we have died to self, that we might live again in the new life and love that you have given to us so freely in our salvation. So as we celebrate Christmas this year, may it be a special Christmas. May our world see the love of Jesus in each one of us as we go from this place. And we pray that not only we, but those around us might experience the blessing of Christmas for your name's sake. Amen. Amen. And a Merry Christmas. God bless us, everyone.